It's a great privilege to be back here. Uh, I didn't expect to be back here, so I don't know if I'll say I'm glad to be back here, but I am. Uh, we're supposed to be in Ghana, or India, or France, or somewhere. Um, our international ministry became United States ministry, and Sharon and I have been super busy. We've been to Indiana for a VBS recently, and got to see the Fagans, and so Andrew, uh, David Fagan's grandson came over here for the first time he's been uh, west of the Miss, uh, Mississippi. So he, Illinois is the farthest west he's been, so he's had a wonderful time. Great peaks, fantastic messages. Uh, wow, I am pumped up and um, excited. I really am excited. And um, I also have a brain fog from not sleeping. Something about wet tents and being 60. I saw some pictures from the peaks. It's like, is that me? Okay, yeah. <laughs> the barber just can't get those gray hairs out anymore. But uh, I am, I'm thankful I can share the word of God at the peaks and here with you, this great assembly of saints. You know, you're a miracle. As you sit there in your chair, I do not see people of any race. I see except for the new creature race. And it's exciting. You know, it's a weird time we live in. If, if Andrew, I can have that cup of waters on the fountain in the, there. He, thanks. He's been a big help to me, I'll tell you. It's like Timothy serving, you know, Paul. But we live in a weird time. You know, the very things that we've done in Ghana to try and show God's love and, <coughs> and follow Christ's example can now be used against us in present thinking. Thanks, buddy. Um, you know, we've taken a young lady, a uh, girl, when she was... Nine, Alima, Yaya, from the Wangara tribe of Burkina Faso. Uh, she would have been given away to some old guy, maybe when she was about 13, 14, and he was 40, 50. The, the, some of the tribes in Ghana, uh, Steve is here, he can verify, they would trade their daughters. You know, you can have my... It's abuse. It's abuse. I mean, they're underage. Uh, that's what they do. So... We got her because she was Abby's uh, younger sister and uh, took her in to give her a Christian education, give her all the benefits of Western civilization, help her to know God and, and to be a quality person, which she is. And uh, she's now married and she should have a baby in November. We got to get back by then or Sherry will have a fit. And I won't be happy either. But, you know, what many would say we've done is we've culturally appropriated her. We've taken her out of her people. We've done the wrong thing because we've ripped her out of her collective, her tribe, her uh, group think. Uh, that's what tribes are. And we've made her become a white person or something like that. It's just unbelievable what's going on these days. The very thing that for generations has been seen as an act of kindness and, and an upgrade and a help is now seen as a wrong thing. Well, I got to thinking about that and some of the Sunday school lesson today. Uh, I didn't get to say all my comments, so now I get to do it. Ha ha. <laughs> but I, I, I just get kindled and stirred by good teaching and by other people's thoughts. That's the way we all are, actually. That's why we need to come together, assemble together, and stir one another up, right? Because we need to do that with each other. It's not about some talking head. You know, Zoom was fine if you had to use it, but man, that's not the same as being there together and interacting, so that's what we're doing. But, you know, the, everything belonged to the king, and Brother Mel talked about how he could not cut a tree except a certain size because it belonged to King George. And so the Americans said, enough of King George, we're going to take this property for ourselves. And uh, we know the history of America's foundation. Um, so I got to thinking about us and our King Jesus. You know, are we in a monarchy, a republic? And one of the statements that Brother Jay made was, no government, no matter how good, is going to be perfect because you don't have the building blocks of a perfect government because man who is the one running government is not perfect. So no matter how genius the idea of the founding forefathers was, the fatal flaw in any plan is the building blocks, which are people who are sinners. And at some point they will cave in and sin, even the best. So you want to probe around and look at George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and find their sin in their life, let's call it sin, yet you'll find it. You'll find it in the present president, you'll find it in anybody. 
you can always find that. But a monarchy is the best form of government when the king is perfect, and we have a perfect king. So the kingdom of God, kingdom of God, is what? Perfect. And yet, how could he build a perfect kingdom without, with imperfect people? And this is why we need spiritual stones, living stones, that have been cut by God himself out of this earth, quarried away and brought to the temple site, and prefabricated stones that they are put together seamlessly like the great stones in the pyramid of Cheops, which is 13, 13 uh, acres at the foundation, 500 feet tall, and I was inside of that at the age of 16, and I looked at, as we went up the ramp inside that pyramid, each of those limestone or sandstone blocks, you couldn't get a razor blade between them. The, the engineering feat of the Egyptians was so great, and I think it was a Joseph who taught them how to do pyramids, and that's a long story, but they were able to build with these giant blocks, no modern equipment, and put them together by the, I don't know how many blocks, I should have looked that up, are in that pyramid, so you can't, to thousands of years later, can't put a razor blade between them. That's amazing. That's what God, see, is doing now in building the temple, the IHOP, the International House of Prayer, two peas and praise. Not pan Don't think about pancakes. Didn't you have breakfast? Uh, I had a wonderful breakfast. Miss Katie just stuffed it in. So I'm not thinking about breakfast or food for a change. I'm thinking about I hop International House of Prayer and Praise. That's the big picture. And it's God who's building that. But we human beings uh, being sometimes... Oh, no, wait. He just contradicted himself. We who can be human beings, if we're not thinking as new creatures, who can act like the old men if we're being distracted from who we really are. So you get what I'm saying. I'm not trying to create an unnecessary duality here. But... Being still in the flesh, let's put it that way. It's subject to certain influences like the devil and the world and our flesh, what we have to overcome. We can culture appropriate God's kingdom for ourselves. We can misappropriate it. In other words, let's say that as I stand here right now, I think this is my Bible. My Bible. And I got my name in it. Well, do I? Probably not. But this is my Bible, you see. And this is our church. Where is your church, Matt? Where's your, have you ever heard that? What's the name of your church? And I always say, I don't have a church. I don't have a church. And even though this printed copy of the true word of God that originates from heaven by men who were inspired by the spirit, and these are spiritual words. See, I don't care who's standing up here. If he is speaking from here, he's God speaking, not a man or a boy. I had a young man this morning. Impressive words. Should I sit there and go, well, who's he to tell me what to do? I'm a big old veteran missionary, you know. Has he earned his stripes to be up here telling? It's God's word, amen? It's God's church. Everything belongs to the Lord, the earth, and the fullness thereof. And we don't really own everything. Now, here on earth, I'm all for private property, and the Bible supports that. If you didn't have anything that you owned, you couldn't give anything to God, including your body. So, but... We were bought with a price, right? We're not our own. Therefore, glorify God in your body. See, there's a certain prideful tendency for us as people, maybe as Americans, whatever, to take for ourselves and reset it or re, what's the word, retool it, uh, rebrand it, we heard, in our own image, to make God in our own image, to make the church something that reflects our will, not his to make the church something that feels good to us, something comfortable, something where we're, you know, able to enjoy it because it's not stretching and pushing and pulling us to a higher standard. But that's not why we came unto Christ, to be the same people. We came repenting of our stinking, filthy, rotten, no good sins, our, our worthless, futile way of life inherited from our forefathers. Whether they were good old Montana forefathers or they were North Carolina Tar Heel forefathers or Ashanti, Ghanaian forefathers. There's a futile way of life, Peter said, that we inherited from them. There's none righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's nobody can pridefully stand. But like Job, we must bow and say, He is God and we're not. 
And he gets to set the tone and the standard for what we're going to be and what we're going to do. No one else. And so we come to Christ to be formed by him into his image, not to make him into our image. Jesus is not a long-haired, blue-eyed, blonde-haired, hippie-looking guy you see in all the Sunday school classes, back east at least. That was a paint. We were in the National Museum of, his, of the Bible in Washington, my wife and I recently, and we looked at a lot of beautiful paintings. But the portrayal of Jesus, I would call that a girly man that I was looking at half the time. He couldn't pick up a hammer or move a saw through a board, but I don't believe he looked like that. But it doesn't matter, really. We don't regard him according to the flesh, as we also regard no man according to the flesh. End of racism right there, right? Okay, so I'm, uh, what I want to say here is that the Lord gets to set the standard, gets to set the tone, gets to decide the parameters of what we should be, how we should act, what we should do. Not man, not us. When we come to Christ and are immersed into Christ, we give up our rights to ourselves and hand them over, sign the document in blood that no longer is my life my own. I was bought with a price, therefore now I have to glorify God in this body. It's his temple. It's his temple. And a bunch of Little mini temples make the international temple of God. He's the Lord of his church. He becomes our Lord. That was a summary of what the early Gentiles could confess. Jesus is Lord. Right? Romans chapter 10, verse 13. This is what we need to believe. Uh, let's go to one passage that I... Back there. I'll get my, get my note here. Um back to where they were building the temple. So go back in your time capsule, get on board, and go back there to 1 Kings chapter 7. Talking about those stones, verse 9, all these were costly stones of stones, of stone cut according to measure, sawed with saws inside and outside, even from the foundation to the coping. And so on the outside to the great court. And the foundation was of costly stones, even large stones. I've been told or read that some of the stones were 100,000 pounds. 100,000 pounds. An elephant weighs 10,000 pounds. Five tons. These are some big stones, okay? So, it says... That's how these stones were, according to measure, verse 11. According to the measure, or according to measure. And then we go back to uh, another picture here in Genesis, chapter 6. Noah is a, a righteous man, and God appears to him and says in verse four, uh, 13, God said to Noah, <clears throat> the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Not just wood, gopher, gopher wood. That, man, a lot of gophers to make that. You shall make the ark with rooms. <laughs> that's terrible. With rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. 500 football field and a half plus. Noah's right there like, oh, man, that's bigger than the barn we built five years ago. <laughs> Would you say, can you say again? Can you say that again, please? Did I miss it? I'm getting kind of on in years. What, how old was he here? 500 years? Or, yeah, 500 years old. No hearing aids back then. Did you say 300? Like, is that going to be the short 18-inch cubit or is it going to be the 22-inch cubit? <laughs> Can we make it the 18-inch, please, God? That would save a lot of boards. Uh, 50 cubits, 30 cubits high. And then he talks about these three decks and how to deck them out properly. And I don't know, if, I don't know how Noah heard anything else after the measurements. Like, I would, I'm the kind of guy I get overwhelmed by new things. Maybe, you know, it's like my wife's more confident than me in many ways. She helps me, but I'm like... I always calculate the cost, and sometimes I get a little bit of, like, can I do that, you know? Because to be fair with myself, I'm really going to do it. So I'm really thinking about, can I do it, and how will I do it? 
Some people say, like, oh, I'll do it, but they don't do it. You know, that's easy. No, this task would have to be done by Noah's family while they were still taking care of their livestock, still weeding the corn, still doing, you know, doing everyday things, fixing the shoes, fi- putting a patch on the roof. You know how life is. A donkey falls down in a, somewhere. You've got to go get it out of there if you're a farmer. Uh, butcher things. It's just life. A lot of work. I don't know about you guys, but I can eat quite a bit still. Just ask Miss Katie. Don't tell her. Don't, don't tell them how much. But I did have the cereal and the eggs and the bacon and the toast. Oh, I just told you. And the milk that I bought to add on to that, because almond milk's not milk. But anyway. <laughs> Come on. Milk is just some kind of drink. We'll not get off the subject, will you, Jeff Hostetter? But, um, <laughs> and I did just get off the subject, but... See, this building project, let's go back to that so we stay on track, was immense. And I'll tell you what, uh, I admire Noah. Who's been to the ark dis- display of Ken Ham's? I think it's worth going just to see the magnitude of like, wow. The Amish built that. And as far as we know, he had his boys that could eat a lot. And, and the wives, who were the wives? Where'd they get them? Those are good women. I want to shake their hand in heaven. Are you Ham, Cham, Jabez's wife? I hope they made it, you know. You did a good job there all those years. Now, we know that faith is a picture, right? It's a picture. Who has the picture first, man or God? Who thinks about it and plans it in their own mind? Who had planned all the... They say there's more life under the surface of the earth, more bacterial life and viral life than all the life above the surface of the earth. That's why we have all these Wuhan things. and vi- say that They've studied 4,000 viruses on earth. They've studied them, scientists. There are millions of them. Now, we don't like viruses very much lately. Well, maybe you do, but they really bug me. <laughs> Come on. <It's, laughs> they do. If you didn't get that, wake up! <laughs> Some of the kids are going, what's he mean, Daddy? But all that shows me is how God is the origin of life. Life in abundance. We, we, so many animals aren't here anymore. They've gone extinct after the flood, or at the flood almost. God, you know, God is amazing. Just simply amazing what he can produce, what he can do. And when I think about that, God, I need to think about what he wants us to do. He gets to set the tone, right? So, what has God told us that we have to do? Be like Christ. And we talked about Chuck Dowdy today, and I have a lot I could say about that. He, his church supported my father in Africa missions back in the 60s and 70s. And I think they looked at the diameters of the IHOP of the church and the fact that God was going to make it out of living stones that needed to be perfected. Not, more, not sinners. It's not the song is when all of God's singer, sinners get home. Somebody just asked me, is that what we were singing? It's made up of saints, of stones that have been cut, chiseled, formed according to the measure. What's the measure? The measure of Christ. Is he the impossible dream? Are we just like the ants that think we can move the rubber tree plant, but really can't? I mean, are we just idealists? Seeking for a utopia that can never be achieved? By the way, everybody out in the streets burning things, all those young people, they want utopia on earth. That's socialism, communism, on earth. Forget the pie in the sky by and by. Here's the only life we get have, and we need to make this life in a utopia by social justice and equality and everybody being nice. But they're a bunch of sinners. They can't. It's not going to happen. But what about us, the church? Can it happen? When Jesus looked for the joy that was set before him, was he just an idealist, not a realist? Was he just setting a high, sta- an impossible standard that we can try to achieve to be like him, to walk as he walked, 
to even love as he loved and think as he thought? Did he, did he misunderstand how strong the flesh really is? The flesh? Was he a little bit, you know, young, young Jesus, man. I mean, he, he's a great guy, but not very realistic. But Noah built the ark and fed his family and stayed alive somehow. I don't know if he had a NRA concealed weapon thing that he used sword, but I'm surprised he wasn't killed preaching the gospel of righteousness to those people. But stayed alive, stayed fed, built the ark, got her done, got all the animals in there. God closed the door. Can you imagine his feelings when a year later he and his family step out into a new land? The door, I think, opened by God, though it doesn't say it, and looked up and saw a rainbow shortly thereafter. You think he thought it was worth it? You think he thought it was worth it when all those bodies were floating to the surface and people were screaming at the door trying to get in before? Is it worth it to dream the impossible dream that we can, while still on this earth, glorify God in our body? That we can buffet it and make it our slave? That we can find a way of escape for every temptation? that we can be holy as he is holy, that we can be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect? Are we just a bunch of foolish dreamers? Well, Noah built the ark. He got her done. That was his faith picture. And brethren, I understand the difficulty in this flesh, on this wicked earth, of walking as Jesus walked. No one is underestimating the magnitude of that calling. No one, I'm a 60 now, is saying it's going to be easy. I've unfortunately had enough distractions in my life and tripped and fallen down a few times in my life to know the flesh fails. It profits nothing. But that's all it proved to me. It didn't prove to me that God can't do whatever he wants, that God can't perfect me, that God can't deliver me to the uttermost, that God can't give me everything I need for life and godliness in this perfect age and for the age to come. And it didn't, all it proved to me is I get my eyes off Christ and my faith begins to weaken because you can be stronger faith or weaken faith. It's up to you and me how much faith we decide to take in or have or own. How much of the word of God we love, like a termite chewing on wood, like a beaver, that we love it, can't get enough of the Word of God. Here, this day and age, we can get online and listen to so many great preachers. One of the little kids is covering their ears. Sorry, I'll, I'll tone down. I don't usually have one of these. Like, <laughs> it's so funny. But I'm not trying to scare the kids here. But we have, we have access to the Word of God. This is God's Word. I'm not taking it back, but it is ours too because it's been given to us as a gift by the Father and we have ownership of it, not because we took it like the men who built the Tower of Babel, but we were given it humbly, hum humbly, humbly, Brother Jay said, we, get, get, we humbly receive the Word implanted, which is the Word of truth, able to save our souls. And the more we take in of this, the more faith is being built in us if we believe it and if we put it into practice. This is not a book that will fail us. The contents of this book are dangerous to those who use it, but the more dangerous not to use it. It's TNT. But when you need to move those blocks and those rocks out of your life, you better use it. It's a sword, but it's also a banquet. I love the Bible, don't you? I need it like a man needs an oasis in the wilderness every day of my life. This world is a freezer to faith. This world is a wilderness. We're in a wilderness in so many ways. We're surrounded by unbelievers at work, our neighbors, in the school, everywhere. And those people's lack of faith, their unbelief can be contagious. What's the most sad, saddest verse in the Bible? Maybe Jesus wept. Second one, Hebrews 3, 13. They all perished in the wilderness because of unbelief, right? Unbelief, unbelief. They were right there in the boundary, about to able to go on in to the promised land. And 40 years they wandered in the wilderness and every one of them died except for Caleb and Joshua because of that little thing called unbelief. They didn't take this word and believe it. 
They played with it like it was a toy, not a weapon. And they didn't use it. We have much more of it. We have all of it. We have it from Abraham all the way to Jesus, to John, from Genesis to Revelation. If we don't actually believe it and actually put it into practice, if, if I preached something today and it convicted you about doing something and you don't do it this week, it failed you. You failed it and it did no benefit. You see our message and it's talking about forgiveness and not holding a grudge and you're thinking there, you know, about someone that you might have a little bit of a grudge, you need to make a phone call, send a text or something, and you don't act on that word, it did not benefit you in the slightest. You know how the COVID virus works? How the Ebola virus works? How any virus works? It has to find a host. Ebola virus is of no danger whatsoever to you until it gets in your blood, and then, man, you're in trouble. That's a real virus there. 50% mortality rate on that one. The word of God is like a beneficial virus. When it gets into your heart and mind and soul and you accept that this is true and you act upon it, then the power of the word and the spirit is unleashed in your life. I, I want to be telling, you know, we have a prefabricated church. God thought about you and predicted how you and I would be in all the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. You realize that, don't you? He's our elder brother. Romans chapter 8 says it was his will that, we'd be conformed to the image, that we would be conformed to the image of his son, each of us. That was his will for us. Turn to Romans there. Just make sure you know it's not just Jeff Hostetter saying some highfalutin stuff. I've been down south, so forgive my southern. I'm getting to be like Phil Sutton here. It's all good, even though we lost the war down there. Never got over it. Where am I now? <laughs> Somebody help me out. Um, yeah. What did I just say we're going? Yes. Yes. What would you say? Where, where are we going? This is a test for me and you. Romans, but what, what did I just... Oh, I didn't say it. Okay. <laughs> See, I got it. Don't say it. I got it. Romans 8. Brain fog be gone. In the name of Jesus. Okay, I'm good. Romans 8, verse 30. Whom he predestined. Let's start in verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become. This is my message right here, by the way. To become conformed to the image of his son. But see, that's what we've been saying. There's a pattern here. It's God's parameters. It's God's best specs. It's God's dimensions. It's God's measure. Thinking of a cube. The, by, by the way, New Jerusalem's a cube in Revelation 21. Just an interesting side point. Three-dimensional. Full. With height, breadth. With height, breadth. Everything of God. Love, joy, peace, insight, wisdom. God, you know, in the full dimension. Be conformed, shaped, made. Chuck Dowdy got it wrong. Made. Jesus even was made to be our high priest by the things that he did, by his obedience. He became what he was, you might say. He became what God dreamed for him to be, what God planned for him to be, what he was, what, the lamb before eternity? from the foundation of the earth. This whole thing was pre-planned, pre-fabricated by God. He's not guessing. He's not experimenting. He's not innovating. He knew exactly what he was doing when Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, that's not a social club. That's not a political group. That's not some kind of institution of men with its bylaws and its rules and regulations and its times of meetings and its fees that you must pay. No, 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 no. It's a living organism. It's a body of Christ. Would you attach your head to gorilla? <laughs> Some people seem to have done it. Would you attach your head to a chimpanzee? Would, you put, would Christ put his head on a body that doesn't conform to him? Not the same type? A spiritual body? The church of spiritual people, spiritual virtue, spiritual vision, spiritual motives, spiritual morale, 
Jesus is not going to attach his brand, his name, sign it like Nike, onto a church of a bunch of carnal-minded people who aren't like him. He won't do it. Can't force him to do it. He's out of there. He said, lukewarm Laodiceans, and out of him. Right? We must conform, comply, not to the government. I appreciate that the president of this country said that America was not built on, in government we trust, but in God we trust. Whether he meant that or not, that's the right words to say because they're true. We were built on the foundation of in God we trust. I'm not judging what he meant. I don't know people's motives. You can't know those usually. This scripture, let's look at it again, says he predestined. Predestined. Would you get on a train to go to California and be disappointed if, why, when you got on board, you found out it was actually going down to Cal, uh, Mexico? I actually, I shouldn't admit it, but I once got on a plane going to the wrong city. I need my wife sometimes. <laughs> you know how nervous it is making me travel by myself with my executive secretary back in North Carolina. It's like, I have to be thinking all the time about what I'm doing, or I leave my wallet somewhere, or I don't have a wallet, my money. You should... There's a predestination, and it's not cloudy or mystical or obscured. It's not to be imagined by men, and we have to have meetings to see what, you know, what's our destination? What are we to be conformed to? It's the image of his son. Read the Gospels. You get a good start right there. To be like Jesus. That's so, to be like Jesus. And almost anybody of faith out there would say, yeah, that's our goal, to be more like my Jesus every day. I want to, that's an old VBS song from the 80s. I want to be more like my Jesus every day. I want to be more like, did you ever know that song? Like my Jesus and do just what he pleases. This is a great song, actually. I want to be more like my Jesus every day. A couple problems with that. One is you've got to really believe it. It's nice to sing with the VBS kids. Nice, catchy little tune. That's why I remember it. I was younger then, too. I remember stuff from back then. But the other thing is, did you hear that more like? More like. It's the same thing as saying I'm working on being, I'm trying, I'm striving. No, I get that. There's a certain striving in Christianity. But if you went to Noah, and it's about two months before the flood, and he had got up to the first deck... And you said, uh, <laughs> how you doing on, the no on, on that ark? He said, well, I'm working on it. There's grace, but there's not grace to be abused. There's time, but time can run out. I hope during this COVID crisis, pandemonium, pandemic, panic worldwide, and a lot of weird things going on, I would think it'd be smart to make sure our house is in order. Just, to, just well, I mean, it's weird days. Have you built your own personal house according to the image of his son? Is your life conforming to that? How much time do we get? You know, Brother Benoit said, Dad, the Thessalonians, how much time did they have before Paul was writing to them or the Philippians? The problem of being an old Christian, I don't just mean old in age but in time in Christ, is somewhere along the line it's easy to settle. Somewhere in there, our great early first love Oh, it can't happen to us. Just the Ephesians. Can somewhere along the line be lost in the daily humdrum of life, of getting up and buying and selling and working and dealing with this problem and that problem, and we've all got lots of problems. You know, my wife has plantar fasciitis. She couldn't walk for three months. I had malaria before I left Ghana, and this stuff just wears on you, all of you. You know, I'd, I mean, Phil can't even walk right now. He didn't plan not to be at the peaks, but there it is. Last year, Larry couldn't be there. He was, life can wear out your idealism, your dream to be just like Christ. And you have to fight back. I'm telling you at 60, I believe more, not less. I decide to believe more. It's a decision of my will that God said it, and I've thought it through a long time ago. God cannot lie. He's not the author of lies. Satan's that one. And if he says that I'm to conform. This word here, it says it. I, I'm going to read it again. For whom he foreknew, God foreknew, he predestined to become, this is not iffy, this is not subjunctive, this is not maybe, 
to become conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren whom he predestined, he also called, past tense, whom he called, these he also justified, past tense, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. I've already been glorified in faith, in the spirit realm. If you could see me, if you could see me seated with Christ right now in heaven, you would see the real me, not this aging me. If you could see, if I could see you where you're really seated, not in those chairs, but with Christ in heaven, it would be a glorious sight. You look, y'all look good anyway. You're all dressed up and you got your perfume on and your church clothes, as they call them. But man, if I could, by faith, if I really see you, I see this is true now. And if by faith we continue to walk in faith in the spirit, it can be true for eternity. It's not yet appears as we are, but when he appears, then we shall appear as he is. This is a done deal in God's mind. He has predestined it. He's already seen it, imagined it, envisioned it. And in a way, he's really done it. Now, I'm not going to go into Calvinism here, but God is sovereign. And what he puts his mind to do, better believe it, he gets it done. That's a history that I read in the Bible. Not man's failure, but God's success. God wanted David to win. He won every battle he ever fought. Then after the guy was midget or giant, he'd take him down. Solomon got the temple done, didn't he? So many success stories. Sarah had the baby. Abram left Ur and Haran. You read Hebrews 11, what do you see? What God did through them, not what man did. But what they, when you say what they did by faith, it means what they could do because God already had the picture before they did. It's already a done deal in his mind. He had, he exact, Jesus said, I'll build, I said it, my church. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. This is a dynamic truth statement by the Savior before he's even died on the cross. There's no doubt about our victory in Christ in Christ. We win. Read the back of the book. Don't run from Calvinism so far. You're into territory of, are you saved? Try this in many churches. I don't know. I hope so. We'll find out when, you know, we'll find out. These are literal words said to me by people in Christian churches. They don't even know if they're saved. Now, we're being saved. I get that. And so, there's a realm that, if they mean I believe I'm saved now, but I can't guarantee the future unless I continue to walk in faith. I get that part. Our future is God's history. He's beyond time. God, when he makes dynamic prophetic statements about us like in Revelation, how do you write a book before it's happened? As uh, Revelation's history for God. He has no doubt of the outcome of his battle with the dragon at all. He has no doubt. And see, I want to go back to when you read the prophecies concerning the Christ, our Lord, they're about you. Was there any doubt that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem? Despite Herod. Any doubt that the Romans would develop this unique way of killing enemies of the state called the cross when it was predicted by Isaiah 750 years before? Or Psalm 22, piercing his hands and his feet. God's a God that is so immensely powerful that all things are under his jurisdiction, under his sovereignty. And see, that's where we want to be at in our faith. Is This is not a hope so. This is a no so. And it's not a have to. It's a get to. We need to be in our faith confident of who we are now, without doubt. Doubt is the enemy of faith. Unbelief could be called. So when you and I are facing increased mortality of fellow brethren dying and leaving us, when we look at the aging bodies some of us have, or we look at the disappointments of our earthly dreams 
and we look at the Antifa on the streets and we hear of this chaos over here. It's always been like that. First century saints had to face Caligula and Nero. Jesus was born because a tyrant called Julius, uh, Caesar Augustus gave a command that every single citizen of that empire had to go to their hometown and register. Whether you were this pregnant or not, you better be on the road. And that's how Jesus was born, under dominion of a very hard government. Romans didn't play. They're going to beat Paul to death, remember, in Jerusalem. And he stopped them. He said, is it illegal for you to beat a Roman? He's getting older by then. I mean, that's going to hurt. And they stop everything. People have lived under repression. I went to France in October. There's 4% of French people believe in God. It's a completely secular state. Your income tax is 48.5%. We don't like our taxes. Many people in China are believers and have been living under communist China rule since 1940, what date is it, Jay, 47? 49. Like it or not, here they came. Supported by American funds, by the way, if you check it out. Don't like it? Tough. That's where you're born, can't get out, you're in it. Had a friend, Mike D., went to China, taught English back in the 80s, I think. They went, he actually made a convert there. He's teaching English to win souls. And a guy, a Chinese man, wanted to be baptized. They went to the city park, and they're playing like they're wrestling. And then when no one's looking, he baptizes them and puts them up. Because if he, the guy would lose his job, maybe be arrested. What do you do when you're feeling hemmed in? When you're feeling a little discouraged by life? You feel a little disappointed that some of your goals and dreams maybe haven't come true so far. What do you do? You believe more. Like Habakkuk in chapter 3, even though the fig tree is withering and the cattle are perishing, even though the grocery store has no toilet paper, that's really bad, isn't it? Pine cones aren't the best. Or, sorry. But even though things are so bad, and I'm... I'm it is okay to joke about it. Because we, the woman in Proverbs 31, representative of the church, she could laugh at the days to come, right? We can laugh. Ha, ha, hoo, ha. Satan, you're a liar, and you know you're a liar. You are so worried about us that we, the sleeping giant, finally know who we are. We're going to crush you under our heel. We are taking the battle to the enemy. We have the weapons that are not of this world. We are the winners, not the sinners. The winners, not the sinners. Amen? And we need to adopt that attitude stronger in these times. We, it's halfway through this COVID, I realized I couldn't get back to Ghana. The borders are closed. Borders are closed. Bad news. All they see is a sin station, CNN. And um, I tell you what, it's all bad. America is bad. The COVID's everywhere. We're all dying. You shouldn't even be here. You should be in the hospital. That's all they see. You think they're going to let an American into Ghana? Bringing the COVID? Probably come out of his, my ears? Can't get in there. Tried. Sherry and I have been practicing our canoeing. We've got about 200 miles under our belt. I think my wife's serious sometimes. Like we, she said, we go up to Greenland, and whoo we honey, there are killer whales up there and icebergs. We can't get back. But I thought about Apostle Paul. Two years, last thing we see in his life, he's a prisoner. Got Brutus chained to his ankle. Won him to Christ, probably. Whole Praetorian Guard heard the gospel. Yeah, he's shut down. He's quarantined. Big deal, you can't quarantine the Word of God. They're all coming to Paul. It's an ideal situation. He's older now, it's hard to get around. You know, he doesn't have the same energy. And they're coming to him. Class number two, class number three. Line up there, boys. Read Acts 28. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I haven't been reading your Bible. Get in it. He's there, chained up. Uh, Brutus, I need to go to the bathroom now. Well, I'll unlock you, Paul, I trust you. <laughs> but by law, if a Roman soldier lost his prisoner, he died. That's the end of Paul's life. Victory in Jesus. He's a prisoner. And then they take him out and chop his head off. They say it bounced three times, and there's a cathedral to this day where there's three springs of water. Wow. The Catholics know how to work, a, work, a, work something for their advantage. <laughs> bounce, bounce, bounce. Oh, well, he did a lot of miracles. <laughs> That's in. Let's say back in that day, you're a Paul lover. You love him. You're like the Philippians. You even sent him some money from time to time. And now you heard he had his head cut off. That Roman government. Satan's, in the, Satan's winning. Oh, and Peter's, some say, 
crucified upside down. Where's the victory here? Things are looking pretty bad. Our leaders are dead. There's never been good times here on earth. It's only been appearance of good times. The good times are bad times usually because people become apathetic and affluent and they don't care anymore. They become lukewarm like the Laodiceans. Affluence and easy days are not good for the church. Amen? God is doing everything just perfectly, brethren. He's developed your personal obstacle course to train you like a Spartan run so you can be spiritually fit. Whatever you've been going through or going through, whatever challenge you're facing uh, morally, financially, whatever, um, family problem, nationally, I'm telling you, God has allowed it. Because back there in Romans, we were reading about conforming to the image of the Son, but go back to 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for the good, for those who love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, we should say, and are called according to His purpose. You know, all, all the stormy seas of our heart, all the emotional turmoil, all the tension, all the anger, all the bitterness, all the, you know, how it feels. You're, you're like me. Even Jesus kind of had a taste of that in the Garden of, Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, Father, but your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. Not my will. So he tasted that for us. But he got through it. And after that prayer session, he comes out, he's the boss. He's the man. He, they're falling on their face when he says, I am. He's sticking on ears. He's, he's giving them directions, basically. Come on, chain me up here, boys. Take me to the cross. That's what you're supposed to do. Get me up there. And then he's up there forgiving his enemies, and he's taking a thief with him to paradise, and he's getting his mother set up to be taken care of by John. He's totally in control. When we relinquish our fears and frustrations about whatever, and trust that the Lord knows what he's doing, that he's in charge and he's large, and he's got it. And like, then we can be like Captain America, and we can say, I got it too, I can do this all day. Bring it on, I can do this all day. That's an internal mindset. Yeah, I might have back issues, I might have knee issues, I might have family problems, uh, and it's never not been like that, but you know what, God's greater than all that, and he planned to let that all happen, including America becoming maybe a communist country one day, whatever, the worst case scenario, whatever. Whatever. It's for our good if we're caught according to his purpose. And we, because you know what? Those stones, how did they make those stones to take to the temple? They had to chisel them, cut them, according to a certain measure, so they'd fit together. We're not in heaven yet, so right now God's chiseling on your life. He's getting rid of a little bit, maybe a little bit of self-interest still there? A little envy still in there? Anybody dabbling in pornography in here? Anybody here playing with your relationship with your wife? Anybody here still doubting that you can be like Christ? Have you settled? I'm more like Christ, more like my Jesus, but I can't be just like him. That's for after I die and go to heaven. Right now, it's in the way. Well, that's Gnosticism again, coming back up. That's not faith. And to believe that you can be like Christ after you get to heaven is hindsight. It's not faith. To believe you can have victory before you have it is hindsight, not faith. And it counts for nothing with God. We're to be people of the Spirit who live by faith, not by sight. And so I've been thinking, during this COVID crisis, I got to thinking, what do I need to do? Charge! Go forward! Upward, praise God, have a great attitude in the morning. I'll be honest, I've had some days I felt really low. I mean, my dogs are over there. Oh, sorry, <laughs> speaking to no dog lovers here. My grandkids are over there, there we go. My kids are over there, the brethren are over there, my house is over there, my office is over there. I've been living out of a suitcase in my in-law's house for the last four months. Not my choice. And there were some days I got up like, boy, this is not what I planned. Brethren, you probably felt that way too, haven't you, sometimes? And you probably look at the mask and you have different, you know, that's a big contention, have different opinions about that one, but you, no one likes them. Nobody likes them, especially in the South in 100 degree heat. And we don't, I got here to Billings and there's three guys in fatigues, National Guardsmen, taking my temperature. 
And the libertarian part of me is like, get that on my face. You know, I've been in Africa with AK-47s on my face. It feels like Africa. Because I thought, what if they saw I had a temperature? Would they put me in quarantine? Would they put me back on the plane? It was kind of disconcerting. I wasn't warned about that. Just, Sir, do you have any fever? Have any symptoms? Like, what? <laughs> no, I'm good. Good. <laughs> all right, welcome to Billings. Oh, man, I didn't expect that. And all my libertarian instincts is like I wanted to challenge them and say, why did you do that? I have a constitutional right to, to no invasion of my privacy. My, you know, I have a lot. And all would be true, but what good would it do? I need to go preach. Let's just not be discouraged, brethren, because tyranny happens. People are bad. Vote smart. Pray all you want to. Talk freely about what you know is true on political things, on anything. That's fine. That's your right. Paul took his rights as a Roman, and he used them. But in the end of the day, no utopia here. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, and our real hope is in heaven, not on earth. And we've got to work, like Brother Jay said so well yesterday, we've got to work things out to figure out how to be effective and fruitful and happy and joyful and united and filled with the Spirit and be just like Jesus, not more like our Jesus every day, by faith. We can do it. You know, I took a concealed weapons class on Saturday on my birthday. It's my wife's idea. I think she wants me to shoot the bears next time they come after us. There are a lot of them down there. More bears than people in Tyrrell County. So... Uh, you know, they taught us about the castle doctrine. I knew about it. And then the stand your ground. North Carolina has the freest gun laws in all America, they, our instructor said, except for Texas. Texas can just shoot a man for saying something you don't like. But <laughs> and I was, I'm a spiritual-minded guy, so I'm thinking about spiritual weapons and spiritual defense, and I'm just taking all these in out. But what I'm trying to say is we need to stand our ground. And what is our ground? That we've been called to be conformed to the image of his son. We are to be like Jesus. We are to be Jesus to the people around us. Ambassadors of God, shining brightly. We can do it, because in God's mind, and in his will, and his might, his vision, it's already been done. We're just playing it out, manifesting what's already true, bringing it to light what is already true. That's what faith is, believing, in things that you can't see and haven't experienced personally beforehand. So your pregnant, your old wife can have a baby. Your Isaac can be raised from the dead. As far as we know, I'll finish on this, Abraham had never seen anybody raised from the dead. The first biblical account of a resurrection is Elijah and the Shulamite's child. That's the first account of a resurrection. If there are any other resurrections, we actually don't know about it. I love Abraham, don't you? Here's Isaac. I think he's a pretty big-sized boy. Father, Dad, we got the wood. We got the altar. Where, where's the sacrifice, Dad? It just breaks my heart to think about it. Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. And he took his Beloved son, he waited so many years to have. He was born by promise and miracle. And he laid him down on that altar. And he took out that knife. Knowing that if he did drive that into the heart, or cut the throat probably. That's what they do in Africa when they butcher a ram. And he saw his son bleed out on that altar. And maybe the pain in his son's eyes. And he said, Dad. He knew, according to Hebrews, that God could raise him from the dead and would fulfill his promise that, that through him there would be a legacy and one day there would be a Joseph and Mary and there would be a little baby born in Bethlehem who would bring to us the light and save multitudes. He believed in hope against hope. Let's do the same.